Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kim Wilcoxon, and I'm a partner in Thompson Hines Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Practice in our Cincinnati office. I'm thrilled today to be joined by my colleague, Meredith Kimmelblatt, a managing associate in our Washington, D.C. office. This is the third webinar in a four-part series that will provide an overview of fiduciary obligations for health and welfare plans, and then deep dives into specific fiduciary issues. Today, we're gonna to focus on prescription drug issues that fiduciaries should consider, including pricing and contracting with PBMs. Before we begin though, just a few housekeeping items. Today's program is being recorded and we'll send a link to all attendees, including the PowerPoint, within 48 hours of today's presentation. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to use the question box located in the control panel on the upper right side of your screen. We'll answer as many of the questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for your interest, and now we will begin. Today's presentation, we're going to start with a level setting reminder of basic fiduciary duties. Then we're gonna go uh, and provide some information to help fiduciaries make informed and prudent decisions about pharmacy benefits. So we're gonna start with some basics about PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, We'll talk a little bit about selection and monitoring of service providers and issues raised by a recent litigation complaint. We will also talk about manufacturer's assistance programs and then relatedly copay maximizer programs. We'll talk a little bit about characterization of prescription drugs as essential health benefits and then finally round out the presentation with a discussion of state regulation of PBF. So to begin with, a reminder of the fiduciary duties, the basics, uh, if you tuned into webinar number one in our series, you've already heard this, but just a reminder that ERISA requires a fiduciary to discharge his or her duties with respect to a plan solely in the interests of participants and their beneficiaries for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to participants and their beneficiaries and defraying reasonable expenses of administering the plan. And here's where we want to focus a little bit today with the care, skill, prudence, and diligence under the circumstances then prevailing that a prudent person acting in a light capacity, and here's the issue, familiar with such matters, would use in the conduct of an enterprise of a like character and with like aims, and of course, in accordance with the documents governing the plan. Our goal today is to give you some information so that you can act as a prudent person or your clients act as prudent per people uh, that are familiar with matters relating to your prescription drug programs. So to begin with, I'm going to turn it over to Meredith to talk a little bit about prescription drug basics. All right, so we'll start by getting into the basics of prescription drug purchasing, which works slightly different than how we make normal day-to-day -day purchases. So this slide shows the process for purchasing shampoo. In this example, the blue arrows represent the flow of products and the green arrows show the flow of money. And it's a pretty straightforward process. The manufacturer sells shampoo to the grocery store who then sells shampoo to the consumer. And the payment from the consumer minus the payment to the manufacturer equals a profit for the grocery store. And we as consumers are comfortable with the system. We want the grocery store to make a profit so that we have a one-stop shop to buy everything we need rather than having to go to various manufacturers um, to buy different things. And buying prescription drugs is a different, slightly more complicated process. Um, while the structure has similarities to the grocery store process flow, it feels a little bit less comfortable for us as consumers. So in this flow, the wholesaler serves as the grocery store for the pharmacy. Uh, wholesalers purchase prescription drugs directly from manufacturers, then sell them to pharmacies. And unlike when you're going to the grocery store to buy shampoo, consumers who buy drugs from the pharmacy aren't typically paying the full price of those drugs. Um, so if you I think, click the rest. That's where the bottom of this flow comes into play. Um, plans will typically set the cost of the drugs offered to participants through their contracts with pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. And PBMs contract with health plans to perform various services in connection with planned prescription drug programs. Um, this slide gives an overview of some of the typical services that PBMs provide. So they process drug claims and appeals, manage medical management programs create pharmacy networks, set drug prices and reimbursement rates, create formularies and prescription drug coverage tiers, negotiate drug rebates with manufacturers, which we'll discuss more in a minute, 
and provide specialty and mail order pharmacy services. So back to our purchasing flow, um, as mentioned, PBMs will negotiate agreements with manufacturers to determine the drug prices that plans will pay and the payments that pharmacies will receive. And so when PBMs negotiate fees to pharmacies for drugs that are lower than what it charges a plan for the drug, that difference that remains with the PBM is called spread pricing. And unlike the grocery store scenario, the PBM making a profit is a little less comfortable to us as consumers for a couple of reasons and, and to plans. Uh, for one, plans that engage PBMs are already paying them administrative fees and other fees for their services. So any spread pricing that PBMs retain is really an excess non-negotiated payment for PBMs. And plans also don't always have clear insight into what PBMs are paying pharmacies. And as a result, it can be difficult to determine whether the amount a PBM charges a plan is actually reasonable. Um, and as part of these PBM negotiations, PBMs can get manufacturers to pay them rebates, which are discounts off the price of drugs, which PBMs may or may not pass on to plans and consumers, uh, or they might pass on a portion of them. Um, frequently, they're not fully passed on. And we'll talk a little bit later about how manufacturers may charge higher list prices to make sure they have room to provide these rebates to PBMs and kind of what this means for smaller pharmacies. And, and I'll just jump in here because there was a complaint filed on Monday by a health plan in Connecticut against a few drug manufacturers and PBMs arguing that the PBMs and the manufacturers are sort of colluding together to increase the manufacturer price for drug so that the manufacturer has room to provide rebates back to the PBM. Uh, according to the complaint, the, the manufacturer payments to the PBM aren't necessarily uh, reflected as rebates. And so those rebates aren't necessarily passed on to the plan as part of the negotiation. Again, this is just a complaint that was filed on Monday. We don't have you know, visibility into the veracity of these allegations. But it is interesting to see that you know this, this is a, a an area fraught with litigation. There are potential sort of pitfalls anywhere you go with pharmacy benefit arrangements. So it's important for again fiduciaries to be informed about these issues. And so these issues and the whole drug purchasing process has resulted in some pretty novel litigation recently. Uh, specifically, the Johnson & Johnson lawsuit was filed in February of this year, and it's pretty unique in alleging that a health plan breached its fiduciary duties with respect to managing its prescription drug benefits. Um, and plaintiff in the lawsuit is an employee of the defendant company. Um, defendants in the lawsuit are the employer, the employer's fiduciary committee, and each individual member of the employee's fiduciary committee. And in the complaint, plaintiff is alleging that the employer defendants breached their fiduciary duties by failing to exercise prudence in a variety of ways. Um, plaintiff is alleging that defendants um, were imprudent in selecting a PBM, that they were imprudent in agreeing to make the plan and participants pay unreasonable fees for prescription drugs, and in agreeing to contract terms that allowed PBM to enrich itself at the expense of the health plan and its participants. And defendants actually moved to dismiss the complaint a few days ago on the 19th. And one of the key arguments um, is, as expected, that plaintiff failed to establish Article 3 standing, which means that defendants are arguing that plaintiff did not actually suffer an injury in fact as a result of defendants' alleged mismanagement of the plan's PBM and of the prescription drug benefits. Um, defendants claim that plaintiff received all benefits to which she was entitled in their motion to dismiss, and they also claim that plaintiff did not allege that she paid for any of the allegedly overpriced drugs, which we'll get into in a minute. Another key argument in the motion to dismiss is that plaintiffs failed to allege that defendants actually had imprudent processes for negotiating PBM services. Um, and briefing on the motion is ongoing, and it will be interesting to see how plaintiff responds in a few weeks. So this chart shows some of the drug prices under the plan that the complaint alleges to be unreasonable. Uh, plaintiff did some research and found a group of drugs called specialty generic drugs that she alleges has significant price differences between the amount participants were charged under the plan for the drugs and the amount participants would pay if they just walked into a grocery store and bought the drug independent of insurance. 
Um, and it's important to note that these um, prices are based on publicly available information rather than any of plaintiff's actual purchases. Um, and you can see that the complaint contains some pretty glaring examples of price discrepancies. If you look at the third row down, there's about a $16,000 price difference between what the plan would charge participants and what the drug allegedly costs if you walk into Wegmans. And the complaint specifically stated that these prices are not, in fact, typos. Uh, rather, plaintiff is alleging that these significant price discrepancies are the result of employers' failure to prudently manage the PBM's administration of the plan's prescription drug program. The complaint also alleges that the plan should have been more closely monitoring the plan's drug formulary. Um, and you can see a couple of the allegations from the complaint. Um, plaintiff is alleging that a prudently administered plan would steer beneficiaries toward the option with a lower overall price, or at least would not allow a plan vendor, the PBM, to self-interestedly steer beneficiaries toward the option with a higher overall price. And it's, um, plaintiff is also alleging that prudent fiduciaries therefore close supervise their formularies and negotiate payment structures to ensure that PBMs are not acting based on considerations that run contrary to the interests of the plan and its beneficiaries. And this, I think, is an interesting element of this particular complaint because it tends to confuse, you know, settler functions versus fiduciary functions. So in my settler capacity as a plan sponsor, I can design the plan to cover whatever I want to cover so long as I'm not violating applicable law with my plan design. It, my fiduciary obligation is to administer the plan as it's been designed. So it, the formulary really is a list of drugs that are covered under the plan. So it seems like that would be a settler function in identifying which drugs are covered under the plan. Now, granted, I think we're, we're gonna get into in a minute the idea of, well, if we have decided to cover particular drugs that, you know, give more compensation back to the PBM, maybe then we've, we're sort of blending the line between settler and fiduciary functions. Um, but, uh, you know, stepping back in the big picture is, does an employer have an obligation to look through the formulary, identify every particular drug that's on the formulary, every particular drug that's not on the formulary, and confirm that that formulary is what, in fact, they intend to cover? If that's the case, I don't know a single employer who is going to be fulfilling that duty. Um, you know, I, 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 fiduciaries hire experts like PBMs to create and manage their formularies. So again, there's, there's just this sort of interesting blend, of maybe gray area of whether this is a settler function or a fiduciary function. But regardless of you know, the fiduciary's obligation with respect to plan formularies. We, we know that plans have a fiduciary obligation to ensure that PBMs are paid no more than reasonable compensation. Um, and this gets to the spread pricing that we discussed earlier. Um, and it also goes to ERISA's prohibited transaction rules, which, um, as, a, as a reminder, prevent cert prohibit certain transactions between a plan and a party and interest service providers like PBMs, including the furnishing of uh, goods, services, or facilities. If an arrangement is a prohibited transaction, then any fiduciary to the plan could be personally liable for plan losses and other court-ordered equitable or remedial relief. And that's something that, that I think employers may not have paid much attention to on the health and welfare side. You know, a, a fiduciary can be personally liable for certain losses to the plan. And, and in this complaint, where J&J &J was sued, you know, it, it wasn't only the plan sponsor, the company that was sued, it was each individual member of the fiduciary committee, which goes back to something that Dominic said in our first webinar, which is making sure we know who our fiduciaries are and that fiduciaries are intentional fiduciaries, not accidental fiduciaries. Um, you, you don't want to have somebody who's making decisions at the company, you know, be personally liable if they didn't weren't aware of the, that risk and signing up for it. So ERISA section 408b2 provides certain um, ex exceptions from the prohibited transaction rules, and it provides that an arrangement with a service provider is not a prohibited transaction uh, if the contract or arrangement is reasonable, that the services are necessary, so appropriate or helpful for the establishment and operation of the plan, and that no more than reasonable compensation is paid for the services. 
And one way for plans to get a sense of whether compensation is reasonable is by requesting compensation disclosures. And Section 408B2B specifically provides that a contract for consulting or brokerage services will not be considered reasonable unless the service provider provides a disclosure of direct and indirect compensation that it expects to receive under the contract. And this type of disclosure would seem to be incredibly helpful for health plans trying to gain insight into exactly what compensation a PBM is receiving outside of fees that the plan is paying it. Uh, however, there's some dispute as to whether a PBM contract would actually qualify as a um, consulting contract for which the disclosure is required. Um, PBMs have taken the position that they're not consulting on services, they're just providing them, and therefore they don't have any obligation to provide the disclosures. But if you look at the definition of consulting under ERISA, it certainly seems like it would include PBMs. We've highlighted in this definition here um, the services that seem particularly applicable to PBMs, uh, including development or implementing plan design, medical management, PBM services, transparency tools, and third-party administrative services. Um, yeah, you're, you're not going to find a PBM who agrees that they are providing consulting services. And I, and I think the, the, the issue is really in that first line, right, consulting comma, for which the service provider, you know, is providing any compensation, you know, receiving compensation related to. And so the, the PBM or the, the third party administrator, because this issue applies to medical plan administrators as well, they will, they, they're taking the position that they're, they might be providing the third party administration services. They might be providing the pharmacy benefit management services, but they're not consulting on that. They are providing a suite of services for the employer to choose from, and therefore they're not consultants, so they don't have to provide these compensation disclosures. Uh, there is at least one bill in Congress right now that would apply this requirement to specifically pharmacy benefit managers, and I think there's another one that actually uh, sort of more broadly includes third-party administrators. So it'll be interesting to see to the extent that litigation goes through maybe someday we will get compensation disclosures from the PBMs. At this point, it, I think it's difficult to really understand what is the compensation that the PBM is receiving. You know, again, to, to Meredith's point earlier, they're getting compensation in a number of different ways. It could be through spread pricing. It could be through rebates from the manufacturers. It could be through, you know, arrangements with pharmacies. And most of that compensation is just not visible to the fiduciary of the plan hiring the pharmacy benefit manager. So it's difficult for a fiduciary to really exercise their obligation to ensure that the compensation received by the pharmacy benefit manager is reasonable. Now, one way that we might get around that is by negotiating for a different compensation structure. So Meredith, you wanna talk a little bit about the prudent processes for engaging our PBMs. So we just discussed about you know, it may still be worth requesting a compensation disclosure, even though you know, the likely answer from a PBM will be no. And I would say, yes, it is definitely worth that because the plan under 408B2B has an obligation to make the request for somebody who's providing consulting or, or brokerage services. And if there's any question about whether the vendor is providing those services, go ahead and ask, because as long as we have a reasonable, good faith reason to believe that that vendor is not subject to the requirement, then we don't have to take the next step, which is essentially, you know, report the vendor to the Department of Labor and potentially also change our vendor. Um, none of these, as far as I know, none of these vendors are providing the compensation disclosure, so there wouldn't be a benefit in changing providers just to get a 408B2B compensation disclosure, um, but there might be another reason to investigate other providers. Meredith? So in addition, um, it's important for plans to evaluate multiple PBMs before hiring one, um, and similarly conducting regular RFPs and market checks to ensure that the plan is getting the most bang for its buck and hiring the service provider that best fits its needs. And, and the RFP is where the employer has the leverage, um, because the, the once you've told a, a vendor that they have the business, you know, they start the implementation and then they give you a contract while you're three months in and then you negotiate that contract over a year and there's no leverage. There's no reason for the vendor 
to really give on certain things. At the RFP stage, that's where we have the opportunity to, to say, look, if you don't agree to this, maybe one of these other vendors we're looking at will. And so at the RFP stage, that's where you want to say, okay, what can you do for me for pass-through pricing? What can you do for me through spread? What compensation disclosures are you willing to provide? You know, give the RFP, right, the information that you want the vendor to provide or agree to. And that's really where the employer, the fiduciary is going to have the best opportunity to get that information. And as Kim just mentioned, um, another very valuable consideration is understanding what that compensation um, the PBM will be receiving, whether that's spread versus pass-through pricing. Under pass-through pricing, the PBM fees um, or the PBM's primary revenue source are going to be uh, things like administrative or mail or order fees. Um, so it gives employers and plans a better insight into exactly what they're they're receiving. Um, plans can also consider using a purchasing collaborative to procure PBMs rather than engaging in negotiations one-on-one. -on -one. PBMs are often resistant to negotiation, and so this can be a better position for plans. But, but in using a collaborative, there's also something to think about, because this was an allegation in the complaint. There was an allegation that the uh, consultant may be conflicted because the consultant may have an arrangement with the pharmacy benefit manager, whereby the consultant receives compensation for signing up their clients to go with the PBM. So the, the collaborative, I think you can look at in, in a couple of different ways. One is, this is a valid exercise of our fiduciary duty because we're joining with other people to enhance our bargaining power and getting the best deal that we can, or at least a deal that would be better than we could get if we were going out on our own. On the other hand, if you're going with a vendor that has a compensation relationship with the PBM, that vendor may not have full uh, you know, uh, interest in negotiating the best deal for the employers. They may have some incentive in sort of going easy on the PBM. Now, that is not to say that any of the consultants that are offering these you know, collaboratives are doing that but it is a potential conflict of interest that the fiduciary needs to consider when evaluating whether to go with one of these collaboratives. And keeping that conflict in mind for the collaborative aspect, um, if an employer is negotiating for a PBM one-on-one, -on -one, um, they can consider engaging a PBM consultant to help kind of guide them through that procurement process and assist with all the technicalities that come up in the, the PBM world. So I will pass it back to Kim. All right. So we're going to move now and talk a little bit about manufacturer assistance programs, because there are a number of places where drug manufacturer's assistance could impact a, a health plan. Under typical health plans or prescription drug programs, uh, it, covered individuals are required to spend a certain amount of, of out-of-pocket dollars before they hit the out-of-pocket maximum. And then when the out-of-pocket maximum is reached, all other covered expenses are covered at 100%. Well, there are some drug manufacturers that want to help individuals you know, with those out-of-pocket expenses. So they'll either reimburse the participant for the amount of the copay that they have to pay for the manufacturer's drug, or maybe they will you know, pay that directly to the pharmacy so that there's only a little bit left, if anything, for the participant to pay. So the question, and, and just to note that the, you know, drug manufacturers assistance programs take a couple of different um, flavors. Some of them are needs-based, and so the individual has to have income below a certain level. Some of them are not. Some of them will go to you know, whoever, regardless of income. Some of these require that the individual be covered under a plan, some of them require that the individual not be covered under the plan or that a plan not cover the drug that the manufacturer is providing the assistance for. And some of these programs require that the individual have no other assistance that will help them pay for this drug. So if we have a manufacturer who's paying or helping our participant pay for their drug, what does that mean for the participant's out-of-pocket maximum? So under the ACA, you know, non-grandfathered health plans are required to accumulate any cost sharing for essential health benefits to the out-of-pocket maximum. The question then is, is the amount paid by the manufacturer 
cost sharing. So let's say I have a drug that my obligation under the plan is $500. The manufacturer is willing to pay 400 of it. Do I get credit for all 500, which is my obligation under the plan, or only the 100 that actually comes out of my pocket? Well, back in 2021, uh, the tri-agencies confirmed that plans can choose which way to go. That rule about plans being able to choose was struck down last year, um, and we are currently waiting on guidance. We are expecting guidance from the agencies. In the meantime, it is likely that the prior rule is in effect. The prior rule states that drug manufacturer's assistance can be excluded from the out-of-pocket maximum only for brand drugs that have a generic that's available and medically appropriate for the individual. So at this point, while waiting for guidance, you know, it may be a prudent exercise of your fiduciary obligation to reach out to your PBM and say, are you excluding drug manufacturer's assistance from the out-of-pocket maximum? And theoretically, the plan fiduciary should already know that because that should be clear from the SPD. Um, but, you know, are we excluding drug, if so, are we excluding drug manufacturer's assistance for any generic drugs or for any prescription drugs that don't, or that have an available and medically generic equivalent, and I'm stumbling over my words here, but the idea being, is anything we're doing now in violation of the 2020 rule? If so, then the fiduciary needs to evaluate the risk of taking no action. Now, from my understanding, from having asked these questions of PBMs, it, it's not necessarily, um, uh, the PBMs don't necessarily have the ability to make the determination as to whether the manufacturer's assistance is coming for a brand name drug for which there's a generic available and medically appropriate. So there just may not be a way to fulfill that 2020 rule. We'll have to see what guidance comes out. Speaking of drug manufacturer's assistance, um, some plans have implemented programs to take as much advantage of that assistance as possible. So let's take a look at an example of a PPO plan where under the terms of the plan, you know, there would be a 20% cost sharing obligation for the drug. Let's say we have a drug that costs $2,000. And let's say we have a manufacturer who's willing to pay up to $800 of the participant's cost sharing obligation for that drug. Well, 20% of the $2,000 is going to be $400. That's the participant's cost sharing obligation. That's under the maximum that the manufacturer is going to pay. So the manufacturer pays the full $400. The employee pays nothing. The plan then pays the rest of the cost of the drug, which is $1,600. Under a copay maximizer program, the cost sharing obligation increases to match the maximum financial assistance available for the manufacturer. So under this program, the cost sharing would be $800. The manufacturer would pay that $800. The employee still pays nothing, but the plan reaps the benefit of this because now the plan is paying $400 less than they otherwise would have, plus a shared savings fee to the vendor administering the program. Now, if a participant doesn't do what they need to do to participate in this program, they still have an obligation to pay that maximum financial assistance amount but the manufacturer isn't gonna give them any money because the participant didn't apply for it. So it's still an obligation of the employee to pay that $800. The plan still only pays the 1200. This is a very typical design for one of these maximizer programs. So under this design, right, there's $800, it's a cost sharing obligation under the plan. With program participation, the manufacturer pays 800, Employee pays nothing, so there's nothing applied to the deductible, nothing applied to the out-of-pocket maximum. But here's where a potential issue comes in. If the participant doesn't go and get the financial assistance, they're still on the hook for the $800, but the plan design will not accumulate that $800 to the out-of-pocket maximum. So this is sort of the, the stick to get the employee to chase the manufacturer's assistance. Now, some of the program vendors have come out with what they believe to be a high deductible health plan compliant um, design. And so under this type of program, you've got, let's say, 20% cost sharing after the $3,000 deductible is, is your typical plan term. Let's say we have a $5,000 drug and the maximum manufacturer's assistance is $1,500. You know, without one of these copay maximizer programs, first the participant pays the $3,000 deductible. 
Um, then 20% of the remainder is applied. That's $400. Uh, the employee can go to the manufacturer outside of the program and get $400. Um, and, and so the employee then is going to pay their $3,000 deductible, and that's it. And that what they've paid toward the deductible is applied to their out-of-pocket maximum. With the copay maximizer program, now they've increased the cost sharing to 30% after the $33,000 deductible. But in order to make this HDHP compliant, the vendor will not provide any assistance until after that deductible is met. So we have to assume the deductible has been met, the cost of the drug is $5,000, cost sharing obligation is 30% of that, that's still within the amount the manufacturer is willing to pay, so the employee pays nothing nothing's applied to the out-of-pocket maximum. But again, if the participant doesn't comply with the program, the participant still has to pay that $1,500 and nothing is applied to the out-of-pocket maximum. That's where we think there's an issue with these so-called high deductible health plan compliant programs. Because under the high deductible health plan rules, you know, the, the, the IRS has interpreted guidance to say, the manufacturer's assistance may not apply to the deductible. But then there's other guidance, which essentially requires all copays to accumulate to the out-of-pocket maximum. So if we have a participant who didn't get financial assistance, but does have an out-of-pocket expense, we believe that has to apply to the out-of-pocket maximum. And so the design we just reviewed would not be compliant. And so non-grandfathered high deductible health plans are subject to both the Affordable Care Act requirements and the HDHP rules, um, at least one vendor providing these programs has suggested that the Affordable Care Act rules override the HDHP rules since they came out later. Um, however, the IRS has confirmed that HDHPs are subject to both. Yeah. And I would say when, when we talk about IRS confirming the informal discussions that we had with IRS representatives. So unfortunately, we don't have specific guidance out there, uh, but maybe someday we will. So as we're thinking about considerations for if you're thinking about implementing a copay maximizer program or if you have one, some things to think about are number one, the cost to the plan once the assistance is exhausted. So a lot of times manufacturers will apply, you know, provide assistance for a certain amount of time or until someone's reached a certain dollar amount. Under these types of programs, typically the plan is designed so that the participant pays nothing even once that assistance has been exhausted, which then is increased cost to the plan. The plan should be aware of that. Second is plan documentation and employee communications. If cost sharing amounts vary depending on whether a drug is part of this program, that needs to be clear from the SPD. An impact of plan program on eligibility for manufacturer assistance, this is a, a place where I wanna spend just a minute because there are some programs that are not available for individuals who are in a copay maximizer program or who are in a plan where they exclude drug manufacturers assistance from the out-of-pocket maximum. Uh, and so it's important for the employee before signing up for financial assistance to know what the eligibility terms are and to be able to say, yes, I meet these. Um, if you're thinking about engaging this type of vendor, you wanna be sure you know what assistance does the vendor provide? Is the vendor going to identify programs for which the individual is eligible? Are they gonna verify that the individual is in fact eligible for that manufacturer's assistance? Are they gonna help the employee sign up? We do not wanna be in a situation where the plan fiduciary is asking a vendor to sign up an employee for a program for which the employee is ineligible. In fact, this was the subject of litigation, um, with, it's still ongoing, uh, where a manufacturer sued one of these program vendors, arguing that the program vendor signed up people who were not eligible um, in order to drain their manufacturer's assistance more quickly than uh, it, it was otherwise intended. So. I, Sometimes when I describe these programs, I describe them as win-win-win because the participant pays nothing, the plan gets their, you know, the advantage of the maximum manufacturer's assistance, the vendor gets a shared savings cut, you know, everybody's happy except the manufacturer who now is spending more money than they intended to. Uh, so it's, it's important to understand that. I just want to make a note here, back in 2017, 
uh, we got this letter from uh, Amgen, pharmacy manufacturer, send it out to, to pharmacy managers and said, we know about these you know, plan designs. Um, we want you, pharmacy manager, to tell us which of your plans excludes our assistance from the out-of-pocket maximum. And then we're going to tell those people that they're not eligible for our program. Of course, nobody voluntarily <laughs> reported that information. Uh, so now if you look at Amgen's copay card terms and conditions, there's a, there's a statement in there that says if a patient's commercial insurance plan imposes different or additional requirements on patients who receive these benefits, Amgen has the right to modify or eliminate those benefits. So manufacturers who are adjusting amounts based on whether somebody's in a program could impact the cost savings that, that, that plans get from these programs. All right, uh, now I wanna shift slightly, we're, we're still on prescription drugs, but a different legal issue has arisen lately. Um, essential health benefits, just to take a step back, under the Affordable Care Act, all individual policies and fully insured policies in the small group market, or at least non-grandfathered ones, are required to cover anything that's considered an essential health benefit. Self-funded and fully insured plans in the large group market are not required to cover everything that's considered an essential health benefit. Um, but if they do, a plan may not impose, a plan that's subject to the Affordable Care Act may not impose annual or lifetime limits on essential health benefits, and non-grandfathered plans that are subject to the Affordable Care Act must accumulate expenses for essential health benefits to the out-of-pocket maximum. And just a reminder that retiree only plans are not subject to the Affordable Care Act, so if you have a separate plan that covers retirees only, your plan can impose annual or lifetime limits. So uh, are prescription drugs affordable, uh, essential health benefits? Well, the Affordable Care Act in its statutory provision has a list of, I think, like 10 categories of benefits that are considered essential health benefits. And one of those is prescription drugs. Uh, in regulations, HHS indicated that to offer essential health benefits that are prescription drugs, health plans must cover at least the greater of one drug in every USP therapeutic category or class, or the same number of drugs in each category and class as the state's EHB benchmark plan, which suggests that not all prescription drugs have to be considered essential health benefits. And there was some guidance that came out a few years ago about, you know, again, large group market coverage and self-insured health plans, they don't have to cover essential health benefits. And in fact, they have the discretion to define what essential health benefits are. So this FAQ provides another example of opportunities where there could be prescription drugs that are excluded from the category of essential health benefits. Well, last year, we got a proposed notice of benefit and payment parameters for 2025, which indicated essentially that it's always been HHS's position that any prescription drugs that a plan voluntarily covers in excess of the state benchmark plan should be considered essential health benefits. And that of course threw us all into a tizzy because we thought, well, we're not treating all prescription drugs as essential health benefits. We have lots of plans with annual and lifetime dollar limits on certain prescription drugs. Is HHS saying this has always been their position? And if so, is it applicable to self-funded and large group market plans? Uh, we, when the final notice of benefit payment parameters came out this year, they confirmed, yes, that has always been their position, but with respect to individual and small market group policies. At the same time this, the final notice was issued, we received implementation FAQ 66, which indicated that for self-funded and large group market plans, the tri-agencies are planning to propose regulations that would apply similar rules to these types of plans. So if all prescription drugs must be treated as EHBs, that would mean that a plan could not impose annual or lifetime limits on prescription drugs and that all cost sharing must accumulate to the out-of-pocket maximum. So right now, as you're you know, thinking about coverage, and this, this is more of a, again, settler function, your fiduciary obligation is to make sure your plan complies with the law. But right now, taking that settler hat and saying, what do we want to do in light of the fact that this might become against the law 
to apply our annual and lifetime dollar limits. You know, would we at that point eliminate coverage? Would we provide unlimited coverage? Would we impose limits that aren't tied to dollars, such as, you know, fill limits? Um, it's something that a plan should be thinking about now so that if and when it comes to a point where we can't apply these types of limits, you know, from an employee relations standpoint, from a financial standpoint, you've looked ahead and you've made this decision. And if cost sharing has to accumulate to the out-of-pocket maximum, we just talked about the fact that these copay maximizer programs have this sort of, you know, punishment to exclude drug prices from the out-of-pocket maximum. If all prescription drugs are essential health benefits, those types of programs could no longer apply in that way. So that may limit the financial benefit that employers get from these types of programs. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Meredith to talk a little bit about what's going on in the states. And so we are moving into the impact of state laws on PBM regulation and pharmacy programs. And this is a really booming area many states have already enacted or are considering passing legislation to uh, regulate PBMs. And um, these laws can have significant impacts on plan costs and benefit designs and overall uh, plan administration. So this, going back to our chart of how to buy prescription drugs, um, we previously discussed how manufacturers pay PBMs rebates that may or may not be passed through to plans and consumers. Um, and to give themselves room to provide these rebates that the PBMs are demanding on that manufacturer to PBM piece of the chart, um, manufacturers are incentivized to offset these rebates by increasing the list prices of drugs they sell to wholesalers who in turn sell these drugs to pharmacies. And these higher manufacturer prices can be harmful to smaller mom and pop or non-PBM affiliated pharmacies who are purchasing drugs directly from the wholesaler. Um, right, and, and the concern here is, you know, we may have a, it's a very common plan design for the PBM to say, you have to get your drugs, your maintenance medications from our mail order pharmacy. And so we have a relationship between the PBM and the mail order pharmacy where the PBM is directing people to go there. Um, that sort of squeezes out some of those mom and pop pharmacies that are not obviously providing mail order benefits. But even with the retail prices, if those manufacturer you know, list prices go up, that increases the amount that the wholesaler has to pay, which increases the amount that the pharmacy has to pay for that drug. And then the PBM is putting pressure on the pharmacy to accept lower prices from the PBM that, that that's that squeeze. And so there's a concern that these pharmacies that are not affiliated with the PBM or do not provide mail order could be harmed by the alleged practices of the PBM. And so some states have enacted legislation to attempt to address this problem. Arkansas is one such state. And in 2016, they enacted Act 900, which required PBMs to reimburse pharmacies at prices equal to or higher than what the pharmacy paid to buy the drug from the wholesaler. And the law required PBMs to disclose its list of drug reimbursement rates, known as the maximum allowable cost or the MAC list to pharmacies, timely update the MAC list when drug wholesale cost increases and or increased, um, alert pharmacies to changes in the MAC list within a short specified timeframes, develop appeals procedures for use by pharmacies to challenge a MAC that was below the pharmacy's acquisition cost and allow pharmacies to resubmit challenge bills. And as a result of Act 900, pharmacies could refuse to dispense drugs to participants if the reimbursement would be less than what the pharmacy paid, pharmacy paid a wholesaler for the drug. And so um, Act 900 was challenged in federal court on ERISA preemption grounds and a quick review of ERISA preemption. Um, ERISA preempts state laws that relate to a covered employee benefit plan. A state law relates to a plan if it has a reference to or connection with such a plan. Um, to determine that connection, the court asks whether the state law governs a central matter of plan administration or interferes with nationally uniform plan administration. And some examples of requirements that would likely be preempted are where a law requires payment of specific benefits, where it binds plan administrators to specific rules for determining beneficiary status, or where acute economic effects of state law, even if they are indirect effects, force an ERISA plan to adopt certain schemes of subsidy coverage. 
And so the challenge went all the way to the Supreme Court, who in 2020 held that ERISA did not preempt Act 900. And the reason was that the court said Act 900 did not govern central matters of plan administration. Instead, you know, the act merely increased costs and altered incentives for ERISA plans, but it didn't force plans to actually adopt any substantive coverage scheme. Um, they said requiring certain levels of reimbursement doesn't require plans to provide any particular benefit in any particular way. It only really impacts fan plans with respect to the pharmacy rates that the PBMs pass along. Um, and additionally, it regulated PBMs regardless, regardless of whether they were servicing an ERISA plan. Um, and so this Rutledge decision has really emboldened states to enact similar laws, some of which, many of which go even further in terms of PBM regulation than Arkansas, in the hopes that courts will similarly find that there is no preemption. Um, previously, some of the PBM laws were focused on things like imposing disclosure requirements on PBMs, and recently states like Oklahoma have gone even further in seeking to regulate the key aspects of pharmacy programs. And so um, Oklahoma's Patient Right to Pharmacy Choice Act led to another key PPM lawsuit, uh, PCMA versus Mulright. And I'll get into the details of, kind of the aspects of that act in just a moment. Um, but it's important to know that there, the district court initially held that the Oklahoma law was not preempted on grounds similar to what the Supreme Court articulated in Rutledge. Uh, the district court said that the law didn't require plans to make specific choices or really regulate plan design in any way. It just impacted how PBMs could advertise its providers. And so the district court's decision was appealed to the 10th Circuit with respect to four of the act specific provisions. And the dark boxes are referred to as the network standards. Um, in the top left is the what's referred to as the network access standard, which required that a certain percentage of enrollees live within a certain distance of retail pharmacies and mail order pharmacies did not qualify. Um, and that gets to that point about those mom and pop pharmacies, you know, trying the Oklahoma is trying to protect the small retail establishments in their state. Mm -hmm. And so the top right dark box is known as the any willing pharmacy provision, and it prohibited PBMs from denying pharmacies from belonging to the preferred network if the pharmacy was willing to meet the PBM's conditions for preferred network status. And the bottom left dark box is the discount prohibition that prohibited PBMs from requiring or incentivizing discounts or cost sharing or reduction in co-pays to individuals receiving drugs from a particular in-network pharmacies. And then the purple or blue box on the bottom right is referred to as the probation provision. And it prohibited PBMs from denying pharmacies participation in the network because one of their employees was on probationary status with the state's licensing board. And so those um, were on appeal in the 10th Circuit and the 10th Circuit reversed the district court's decision and held that preemptive ERISA preempted all four provisions. And you can see snippets here of the court's rationales for preempting both the network standards and the probation provisions. It kind of talked about the network standards together um, but key reasons here were that the network standards abolished major aspects of plan design. So no longer allowing for a two-tiered network structure, eliminating um, really any reason for plans to use mail order or specialty pharmacies, and you know, the requiring that plans allow any pharmacy into its network that it previously could have um, not allowed. It really took all agency away from plans with respect to how they structured their pharmacy benefit. And with respect to the probation prohibition, the key reason the district or the 10th Circuit gave for preemption was that by removing the requirement that pharmacists on probation can't participate in a network, it was impermissibly forcing plans to use particular networks, i.e., those that were structured to include those pharmacists on probation. And so the court said this was forcing plans to adopt a particular scheme of substantive coverage in violation of ERISA's preemption standards. Um, and so this 10th Circuit decision really squares with Rutledge, um, which said, you know, while states can enact laws that increase plan costs or alter incentives, it cannot force plans to adopt particular schemes of substantive coverage, and Mulready was doing just that. And so the charts on this slide and the next give kind of a high level overview of the type of state PBM legislation that's been passed over the last few years and that's continuing to be passed. Um, you can see that 
all 50 states have enacted at least one PBM related law um, since 2017. Um, and there's wide bipartisan support for PBM reform in various forms. Um, and you can see on this chart that there are some key areas of legislative focus are encouraging greater pricing transparency, prohibiting spread pricing, increasing PBM licensing requirements, reporting requirements, and that kind of thing. And then if you look at the next chart, um, this shows just how many state PBM laws have been passed in various years. Um, 22 were passed in 2023, eight have already been passed in 2024. Um, and what's interesting about some of these newer laws is that they're applying PBM regulations to self-funded ERISA plans, which raises potential preemption arguments. Uh, however, a reminder that although there may be really strong arguments that ERISA preempts some of these laws or portions of some of these laws based on Rutledge and the Mulready decision, states can still enforce these laws unless and until there's an actual court issue determination that the law is preempted. And that's an important point because preemption is an affirmative defense. It, it's not something that you know we can look at and say, oh yeah, this law is definitely preempted because it requires a changed plan design. Like Meredith said, until a court says it is preempted, it's not preempted. That doesn't mean that the PBMs are not taking the position that some of these laws are, are not preempted. Mm -hmm. And so in thinking about all of these state laws, um, there are a few key considerations to keep in mind. Um, employers of self-funded plans should understand and discuss with their PBM uh, the extent to which a state law may impact plan design, any changes they need to make to be in compliance. Um, again, even if it seems like the, the requirement could ultimately be preempted down the road. And employers should also consider who is actually impacted by each state's law and you know, most importantly, who would be penalized for non-compliance with the law, whether the law is targeting the PBM or the employer. Um, but even if the PBM is who would be subject to penalties, it may be that the PBMs would then try to compensate for those penalties by raising um, administrative fees or other fees that they're charging the plan. Um, so regardless of kind of who is targeted expressly in the legislation, it's very important to keep a prize of these laws and how they may impact your plan. And let's talk for a minute about Florida, which I know we didn't do a slide on, but Florida passed a law last year that I think goes further than Oklahoma. So not only does the Florida law impact, you know, the ability to incentivize for use of mail order or, you know, costs that are applicable to the plan, it actually requires that a contract between a PBM and a group health plan have certain provisions. Um, so, and not only that, it requires the health plan to attest to the state of Florida that the contract is in compliance. And this is for contracts that are entered into or extended or renewed. Um, I, and now I'm forgetting the exact date, but essentially if you have one for 20, it was at July 1 of 2023. So if your contract was entered into extended renewed on or after July 1 of 2023 for benefits effective on or after 1124, then the contract is subject to this state law. Um, and when we reached out to some of the PBMs to say, well, would, you know, can we get these provisions in the contract? What are you doing about this? Uh, they, they essentially said, we, we think this is preempted. We're not going to change our contracts because we think this is preempted. So then the next step was, well, is that a danger to our clients? Is, is that a danger to the employer because they can't get the pharmacy benefit manager contract to be changed? Are they going to be able to attest? Do they have to attest to the state of Florida? You know, and, and we didn't see anything in the, the provisions of the statute to confirm that there would be any penalty to the employer for failing to have a compliant program. The penalties all seemed to fall on the PBM. Uh, but we have not seen specific guidance yet on the attestation requirement. Um, and, and so it's entirely possible that Florida could have some sort of penalty that attaches to that. So it's definitely something worth looking at because I think this, this is the state law that I, I'm most familiar with that, that goes the furthest. Um, hopefully, hopefully someday we get some federal legislation that sort of irons all of this out. I 
I used to tell people that I joined the employee benefits group because I only had one law to learn, <laughs> right? Federal law, I don't have to learn all the different state laws, but it, you know, ERISA preemption has really been eroded in the past couple years. And we're seeing more and more places where we do in fact have to be paying attention to, to various state laws. So un unfortunately for fiduciaries, so do you. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn and address a few questions that we've received. If you have a question that you haven't typed into the, um, the, the question box, please go ahead and type that now. First question we received is, what is the name of the complaint that I referenced earlier about the health fund that was suing the, the PBMs and the drug manufacturers? That is International Union of Operating Engineers versus Eli Lilly and Company. It was filed on Monday in the District of Connecticut. Second question is one that uh, is completely relatable to I think everybody on this call, which is essentially, we have no leverage. We try to negotiate with the PBM, we get nowhere. We try to get compensation information, we get nothing. Like. Uh, and, and, and I, I say this is relatable. I, I was reading the, the complaint in the Johnson & Johnson case. If you read through that, and I highly recommend it because it is a fascinating read, the plaintiffs say, well, Johnson & Johnson should have used their considerable negotiating power to drive down these prices. And I laughed out loud because we all know uh, the, how difficult that is. Um, but the complaint actually offers a couple different examples of employers that were either able to negotiate a more favorable deal with, with the PBM or that with, with different PBMs, with different pricing models and were able to get better you know, deals. Um, so at, you know, at this point, what can we do? How do we exercise our fiduciary duty if we can't get this information? Uh, process, 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 process and documentation evaluate multiple PBMs, evaluate multiple pricing methods, get, ask for information. You know, you may not get it, but demonstrate that you asked for it, you pushed for it. You wanna get as much information as you can. And if it's just not physically possible to get the information, it's not, but at least you went through the process of asking for it, of evaluating what you have. You know, you can compare different PBM offerings side by side and different offerings within the same PBM. But it may make sense to hire a, a, a pharmacy benefit consultant, somebody who is really knowledgeable about the way that the PBM world works and how pharmacy contracts work. Um, I, I wish I could remember which consultant gave this presentation, but I saw a presentation once where the consultant went through and said, here are two PBM agreements. And if you look at them on their face, it sure looks like agreement number one is gonna be more favorable from a cost perspective for the plan. But when you get into the definitions of brand and generic and what the rebates apply to, and if you run those numbers, contract two is actually more favorable. And you know, we as lawyers with no you know, clinical expertise, right, we, we couldn't have looked at those contracts and been able to say, this one's better than that one. So having a consultant that is you know not interested with the PBM right? We have to clear our, our conflicts of interest and know whether we have a conflict there. But if they have expertise in pharmacy benefits and can help you understand and interpret the contract, I think that will also go a long way. Uh, let's see. Um, I one question about um, you know visibility of copay assistance programs. Um, you know, the, the way these typically work with the manufacturer's assistance is that the participant applies for it and then they might get a card that they present to the pharmacy. The, or it could be a reimbursement arrangement where they have to send their EOB to the manufacturer. So if they provide a card to the pharmacy, the pharmacy then bills the card, which is essentially billing the manufacturer, and they submit the remainder to the PBM for payment. And from what we understand from the PBMs is it's not always visible to the PBM when somebody's using a copay card and definitely not visible if they're requesting reimbursement. So it is, it's not always possible for the PBM to know whether drug manufacturer's assistance has been used 
and whether it you know, is applying to the deductible or applying to the out-of-pocket maximum because they don't know the payment amount that comes through. They don't know whether that includes copay assistance or not. So that is a practical issue that creates some compliance uh, difficulties, again, with the high deductible health plan rules. But, you know, I don't know that there's anything that an employer can do about that other than, you know, contract with the pharmacy benefit manager to say, you know, to the extent they know they can't be applying manufacturer's assistance to the deductible under a high deductible health plan. And that, I believe, takes us to time. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Within the next two days, you'll receive a follow-up email that contains the recorded webinar and presentation from today's slides. Um, it'll also include links to the two previous webinar in the series and the slide decks. Um, and you can sign up for the fourth and final webinar through the follow-up email or on our website. Um, our last webinar on May 8th will cover more sort of in-depth things that fiduciaries ought to know about different areas of compliance with their health plans. So if you have questions we didn't get to today, please email or call your regular Thompson Hine lawyer. Uh, if you're not a current Thompson Hine client, contact me to discuss available options that will address your needs. And with that, we encourage you to enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.